Hi, everybody. I'd like to invite you all to take your seats so that I can introduce our next keynote presentation here at the Planet Microcap Showcase Vancouver. It is from our one of our premier sponsors here at the event, uh, Lukoski Brookman, managing partner Joseph Lukoski. We're very thrilled that he made the trip up here to Vancouver to give his presentation, The Bell Isn't Going to Ring Itself, The Art of Uplisting, Crosslisting, and Microcap IPOs. Without further ado, Joseph Lukoski. Well, wow, thank you, Bobby, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Before we get started, I just want to say a few words about Bobby and Shelly and Lulu and thank them for all of their uh, attention and efforts in putting on this conference and other conferences throughout the year. They do a first-rate job, and we are very proud and uh, to be a part of it and such a big part of it. So thank you, Lulu and Shelly and Bobby. My name is Joseph Lukoski, and I'm the managing partner of Lukoski Brookman. We are a corporate and securities boutique uh, firm located generally on the East Coast, New York and New Jersey, with a presence in California on the West Coast here um, down in the States. And we are hyper-focused in the micro-cap and small-cap worlds. Hyper-focused. We're not chasing every deal on the planet. We are chasing micro-cap transactions. And we track data and collect data and try to improve the process every day in the land of microcap. So today we're going to talk about why the bell isn't going to ring itself and about uplist, cross lists, and microcap IPOs. So it's a little bit about the firm's geography. And one thing to know: most of our transactions, uh, more and more now, are with an international uh, part to them, especially here in Canada. A lot of you here from Canada, those watching on the live stream can be from other countries, but we have transactions going on all around the world. Canada is a very big part of that, Israel, Asia, Australia, and other places. So before we get into the listing of NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange and some other new um, things we want to introduce to you today, I just want to say a word about uh, the OTC, because that is the premier trading or quotation platform that all of you are probably familiar with prior to getting to a senior exchange. And the OTC is wonderful for international companies that want to get started, get their feet wet, start putting out some disclosure, start communicating with uh, shareholders and other stakeholders, put out some information to execute their business plan and to trade and get some liquidity prior to growing uh, and getting to a senior exchange. So it wouldn't be right to uh, not speak about the OTC because most of the uplists here in uh, or in the United States come from the OTC. And a lot of the cross lists that you're, you're all familiar with are similarly quoted on the OTC. And then they get upgraded to NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, or a new third exchange, which we're going to talk about shortly. One thing I want to mention is the growth, the significant growth of the OTCQX or their international platform. You can see here quickly over the years in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, the trajectory of growth for the OTC international platform has been nothing short of phenomenal. And the reason is because it works. Um, it works. It is a great foundational platform to get started. But once companies get past that foundational stage and the pressure starts to build with institutional capital, shareholders, and others, there's a push to get to a higher exchange, at least in the United States. And that generally has been, for many years, the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Now, I want to cover quickly the listing requirements. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the requirements. But... Uh, in order to get to some of the stuff later in the presentation, we have to cover them quickly. So as you know, we call it the core four. You should remember that, the core four. And core four is to be listed on a senior exchange. You need to have shareholders equity. You can see there NASDAQ versus the New York Stock Exchange, 5 million versus 4 million. The uh, share price, $4 versus $3 the public float requirement or shareholder requirement of 300 shareholders, 400 and a public flow to $15 million. This is generally the core four. And then there's obviously some fees that go along with. Now the listing process uh, generally has been 
pretty consistent and historic over the years, meaning that the vetting process uh, has been fairly friendly, except they're inverted. So NASDAQ, generally, you can apply at any time, generally very friendly, make an application. Whereas the New York Stock Exchange, you generally have to be vetted and approved before you can make an application. So it's a little bit tougher at the beginning with respect to the, to the New York Stock Exchange. Listing requirements historically have been a little bit more uh, restrictive on NASDAQ and a little bit less restrictive on the New York Stock Exchange, but not to any great material extent. Deal making has been streamlined generally. Again, historically speaking, we're going to talk about now in a second, has been pretty streamlined. The pricing, meaning the execution of deals on these exchanges, has been pretty friendly and streamlined. Now, the listing process has been changed significantly over the last year. So in September 2022, a lot of you may have heard or seen of this, NASDAQ took a pause. We refer to it as market participants as the NASDAQ pause, where they stopped listing companies for a period of time. And that pause, because of trading, volatility, some foreign deals, caused a ton of new regulations and other things that needed to be done to put a deal together. And right now, on the right side of the screen, these six topics are the hottest topics in the listing process because they're born out of the NASDAQ pause and they've come to constantly evolve over the last year through the listing process. And I want to just mention these quickly because they are super important. The first one is anchor investors. Everyone knows what anchor investors are. They're super important. Everyone is generally very happy when a big institution comes in, anchors the deal. Well, we're not sure if anchor investors are generally welcome anymore, at least with NASDAQ, depending on how much of a percentage of the, of the book or the offering they participate in. It's a big controversy in the industry right now. Uh, in addition, there are burn rate calculations with NASDAQ, which we don't have to get into, but it's a funky calculation on how to qualify for shareholders' equity. Very difficult. Doesn't really work out well for certain companies. There's also the new concentration and distribution rules. These are pretty much evolving by the day. So I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with this if you're not in the trenches, but in order to do a deal now, especially on NASDAQ, you can't just raise $10 million <laughs> like you used to and say, hey, these are our investors. Now NASDAQ will scrutinize your banker's book, the allocation sheets, you're introducing brokers, if there's any omnibus accounts, where they're located, the geography, down to the investor level, literally down to the retail accounts. And sometimes they say their data analytics don't like this investor, don't like that investor. It is sometimes a very awkward and long process to get approval. So here you are on a roadshow, you know, trying to get a deal done, praying, praying that the bankers get the deal done. And then you have NASDAQ saying, we don't like this investor, we don't like that investor. And it causes a problem on most deals. But with anything, uh, good practitioners know how to get over those humps and get deals done. But it is an issue, and everyone should be aware of it. No longer can you just go raise money willy-nilly and say, we got a $10 million book, $15 million book. There's some other things in here, too. One thing I want to mention is the reverse split. So reverse splits or consolidations in the uplist or cross-list market are common because you got to get the price to be up $4. Sometimes, oftentimes, the price isn't at that level prior to the listing. So you need to do a reverse split or a consolidation. It used to be no problem. You could do a simultaneous reverse split and capital raise and list on NASDAQ immediately, day one. Now, NASDAQ no longer allows you to do that. And depending on how deep your reverse or consolidation is, you have to trade five days post-reverse, 10 days post-reverse, sometimes 30 days post-reverse before they will let you list. And we're going to see later quickly in the data why the uplist and cross market has come down significantly from last year, mainly we believe because of this rule, the non-allowance of simultaneous reverse splits and capital raises. Let's move on because we, we only have uh, about 10 minutes left. So just looking at some of the hot topics in the microcap world right now, and by the way, this presentation is on everybody's uh, desk and it'll be uh, put out on LinkedIn, another live stream for those watching at home. 
But again, these are the uh, six hottest topics that are going on right now. One thing I do want to mention that selling shareholders have made a huge comeback in microcap deals because the amounts of money that are being raised in the IPO uplist and crosslist market have been compressed, meaning in this moment in time, less is more according to the market. So we're seeing deals between five and $8 million go out. As we talked about before, the public float requirement is $15 million. So there has to be a makeup of that gap. How do you get to 15 million? Well, with historic legacy shareholders that make up that gap between the amount of money you raise in the offering and the public float requirement. So we're seeing a lot of selling shareholders be put into registration statements and into deals. Now that causes a whole nother sort of problems that we don't have time to talk about regarding lockups, leakouts, liquidity, um, you know, and everyone trying to sell or get out of the gate at the same time. So it is not without challenges, but they are making a, a very big uh, comeback. There's some other things we can talk about here. I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Pish Posh deal. Um, you guys could look it up. I'll just say it was a pretty historic deal, at least for those of us that practice in the microcap community. It has to do with uh, a banker pulling out of a deal last minute, literally at the eve of pricing because there were so many trades against the deal, literally before they opened on NASDAQ and the banker pulled out and said, we're not going to do this because the stock's going to go immediately to a dollar. And until NASDAQ, you tell us where this selling is coming from pre-deal, we're not going to do the deal. And they pulled out of the deal. And it was a big deal, big moment for the industry. Um, and hopefully that is being you know, fixed. Moving right along. This is really important. I probably should have introduced this better. Let's go back for a second. So <laughs> NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, two exchanges that historically you think about as the senior exchange, whether you're cross-listed or you're on the OTC or on a foreign exchange or marketplace, you want to come to the States, you want to list on New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ you would, or, or senior exchange, it'd be NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. Now, as of June in the United States, there's a third major exchange that has received approval from the Securities and Exchange Commission and is also approved by the CSA, and that is SIBO. And I encourage everybody to take a look at SIBO and what they have to offer. And they're actually going to be doing a presentation here later today. Uh, Eric Sloan is going to be presenting, I believe, at 12 or 1230, either in this room or the room next uh, to hear. And everyone should attend that because SIBO <clears throat> is the new third major exchange that just got approved and they're working through their first deals right now. But the point is that they are new in the sense of listing companies, but not new in the sense of they've been around for almost ever with tremendous liquidity. In fact, I've heard a statistic that their liquidity is one or two percentage points off of what the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ is as far as trading volume, because all of these exchanges trade each other's securities that are listed. So it remains to be seen how quickly they list companies and what will occur but nobody should be afraid of the, the SIBO process. And it is a great alternative to get rid of the friction that we are seeing from NASDAQ and to some extent the New York Stock Exchange in the upless world. And I'm just running through these really quickly. You can see SIBO has a much more streamlined process for listing. This is super important. If you're a market participant or a practitioner or a service provider, getting a deal done is, is generally what we care about, right? Because if we don't get the deal done, nobody's happy, nobody gets paid. And these ever evolving rules, situations, problems that are coming out of the typical exchanges seem to have been solved by SIBO. And while their listing requirements are pretty much on par with the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, the process about how they go about qualifying is much simpler. The biggest thing, the biggest thing that they are going to allow, and this is so important, that for the right companies, they will allow a simultaneous reverse split consolidation and underwriting to trade on day one. That takes the risk out of the process for 5, 10, 30 days where a deal can be killed because of time. That is a huge, huge benefit. In addition to some of these other things, you can see here, and it's all in the presentation materials. The other thing I will say that is from a practitioner standpoint that is really important is that for the $15 million float requirement, 
which sometimes is challenging, you know, a float requirement, which means free trading shares, non-affiliate, have to be a minimum, even if the market cap is 20, 30, 40, 50 million, 15 million public float, they will allow 5 million of that to be, come from a lockup or leak out situation. It never made any sense why NASDAQ never allowed leak out shares to count as float. They're still going to be in the float. They just can't all hit at day one. So SIBO solves that problem. It makes the process way more friendly. They're also not opposed to anchor investors, and they're trying to do this in a more company-friendly, um, industry-friendly manner. So everyone should try to make their presentation today. Uh, we're a big fan. A lot of buzz is going around the United States on SIBO. A lot of bankers are getting on board, and there's you know, likely great things to come from them. So let's just talk. I'm going to skip a little bit here on foreign private issuers, but a lot of you who do run foreign companies or associated with foreign companies, foreign private issuer status in the United States is a big deal because it comes with less restrictions, less reporting obligations, less financial requirements, um, a little bit more of uh, friendly uh, disclosure rules. Now, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because U.S. investors sometimes say, hey, we want the full domestic reporting process. We want to know what's going on every day. You know, the four-day rule for 8Ks, um, we want that. So it's a balancing act between less restriction, less money, and potentially uh, investors who want to see more reporting. But there are tons of advantages for foreign private issuers. And if anyone wants to talk about those rules or qualification, we're going to be here all week. Um, you know, obviously we have a table. We can speak more about how how that works. But the biggest the biggest benefit from being a foreign private issuer, aside from all of the items we briefly mentioned, is that they generally follow home country rules. So in the states, we have this big rule that everybody knows about that says if you're on Nasdaq and you want to raise more than 20% of your outstanding or market cap. You can't do that unless you get shareholder approval. That is a big problem for companies, specifically those in this market that are trading lower or trading down. Now, 20% can be you know, a pretty small number depending on where the market cap of the company is. So for foreign private issuers, as long as the home country doesn't require that, which most don't, you can raise beyond your 20%. Now, on the investor side, current investors, shareholders, you know, legacy investors, you know, they may not like that. That 20% rule is there for a reason. But from a practitioner standpoint and a logistics standpoint, it is a big hurdle. And foreign private issuers solve that problem. So just, again, a little bit. I think the slide's a little quirky here. I'm not sure. But just to kind of regroup a little bit, um, you know, we keep this data. We're ambassadors of the industry. We love this sort of community. And, you know, we're often hired as a special counsel to NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange. You know, we're issuers counsel. Sometimes we're underwriters counsel, but oftentimes we're special listening counsel. It remains to be seen, though, I, and I, I was talking to someone about this last night, if we will have a role as special listings counsel with SIBO. A lot of people say we won't because there's, they're so friendly and so streamlined that, you know, lawyers may be out of a job for special listing counsel when it comes to SIBO status, but we will see. Again, we keep data, data driven, and obviously we try to make this community better. You know, we want to do good deals with good people. We also want our community to be protected so we can have longevity in this process. So this is what we have kind of all been waiting for. This is such fascinating and interesting data. So everyone knows that the markets have been challenged and less is more as far as capital raising. But we're going to look at these numbers for a second. And like I alluded to earlier, the up list, which refers to a domestic company in the United States listing to NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or soon to be SIBO, or cross list, which is a foreign listed company, either in Canada, Israel, Asia, wherever, that wants to list on the New York Stock Exchange. So for 2023, you'll see there have been nine, nine listings so far, as opposed to 30 in 2022 for the halfway mark, which is six months, January to June, significantly down. But if you look over here, the average offering size isn't so down, even though total dollars raised is down. This market is very challenged, but is still going strong and will come back, especially with the addition of SIBO, because the number one gating item is that reverse split 
that we reverse split process that complicates the same day listing is part of why this market is down. Let's take a look at this though. This is the most fascinating statistic that I've seen in a long time and I was completely surprised because if you read the press, you read the industry data, you talk to people in the industry, everyone says the world is falling, deals aren't getting done, investors don't wanna be involved and the data doesn't uh, suggest that. The data actually says otherwise. So for microcap IPOs, which is any IPO done with a market cap under $300 million on day one, that's how we define the microcap. You'll see for 2023, the microcap IPO market is either even or up through six months as far as number of deals. Now remember, the average amount of dollars raised or median dollars raised is down. Obviously in the bull, bull markets of 21 and first half of 22, 15 to 16 million, first half of 23, 8 million. That's why the selling shareholders have become such an important role that we talked about earlier. They're making up that gap for $15 million to get initially qualified on a senior exchange. But this is, this is fascinating because if you talk to people, they say deals aren't getting done, everyone's upset, the market is challenged, which it is, but deals are getting done. And um, despite all of the restrictions, despite all of the um, new rules and regulations coming out of NASDAQ, uh, the markets are moving. And we think they will because the data is suggesting there is momentum, there is an undercurrent in this microcap IPO uh, arena that we are seeing and we expect uh, a fourth quarter to be better than, you know, better than the first two or three quarters here, part of this year. So just again, quick overview of some of the data, which again is in all of your packets. You can see number of deals, not so bad, even or better. Uh, average public offering price, again, down, but not bad. Look at that statistic, $6.11 first half of 2022, $5.32 first half of 2023, which is above the $4 minimum. So deals are still getting done at decent prices. Now, again, if you're an investor, <laughs> solely an investor, you may have a different view, but I'm speaking from the company standpoint and the logistics and market participant of getting a deal done. And again, here we go. Look at this selling shareholders in registration statements and deals to fill that gap period, that gap amount of qualification, 12 deals in the first half of 2023 with selling shareholders versus one in the first half of 2022. And I don't have this date on hand, but I imagine it was zero in 2021 because the average offering size was way above $15 million, which was the minimum. Again, just, um, some recap of some topics that we don't have uh, time to talk about, but are in your packets. And the last thing I want to just refer is to give some credit to all of the investment banks and bankers who work in our space and take their time and effort to do a good job, raise capital for companies, satisfy investors, participate in the industry and the community. And these are the ones that we've come up with and the data that we track. So everyone on this screen has done a deal in the uplist, crosslist, or IPO market. Some have done more than others. If you know a bank that's not on here, please let us know, but that's what our data tracks. And most importantly, so nobody yells at me, they are in alphabetical order. So no favorites. That is the uh, presentation. I don't know if we have time for a question or two. We have two, time for two questions. If, uh, right here. So yes. Yeah, so, Technically, um, we define an uplist or a cross list uh, could include companies that are on the pink sheets. Now, it's a little dip more difficult because there's you know certain hurdles you have to overcome to get to the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, or the SIBO. But yes, pink sheets are definitely uh, part of the process. Now, they got to be better quality companies, but they're definitely included in our data. Sometimes they'll be in the IPO side, depending on the technical structure of the deal. Sometimes they're in the uplist, crosslist side of the data. And crypto, we'll say for another time, that's not sort of this market, but it's obviously a very important part of the markets. That's a great question. We're seeing a lot of this actually. Uh, they're called crossover investments at times, uh, private placements. You know, there's different types of names. We are seeing a slight uptick in deals done prior to the original registered listing, mainly to increase the shareholders' equity um, 
free deal to get around or get through the concentration and distribution rules. So if you have a company that has good public float, meaning you don't need to raise a ton of money uh, on the offering for the listing, but you don't have great shareholders equity or other metrics that you need to meet, we're seeing a slight uptick in private rounds pre IPO or pre uplist. This way, you're not getting caught up in these new crazy concentration and distribution rules where the exchanges don't like your investors or don't like your banker or complain about an introducing broker. It's an easier, more gentle way to meet the requirements without complicating the process. So the answer is yes. You know, that depends. You know, this is a topic we could talk about for days and I have a lot of strong feelings on this. So every banker in the world wants to have legacy shareholders locked up or leaked out. Generally locked up because they want the new investors to have total free run of the market upon the deal. The market has changed that mentality. Uh, and NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange have, have views on lockups and leakouts. But the market has changed that because now the bankers, investors, everybody need the, the selling shareholders. They need the legacy shareholders. Now, how they get leaked out uh, over time or how they get otherwise policed internally is, is a whole nother story. But yes, they are a very, very important part of the process. And they are part of the six cutting edge topics we talked about that are being talked about throughout the industry on a daily basis and how to deal with them. Okay, being told that I have to wrap it up and we are over our time. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for listening. Hopefully you, you know, found some value in this presentation. Um, Please take your book list. There's all kinds of data in there. We also have data at our table as far as uh, more uh, in-depth uh, thoughts on numbers and deals and banks and everything else. So thank you everyone for your time.